Hi everyone, I hope this video finds you well, because today we're talking about Remington. And the reason we're talking about the Remington debacle that went down last week is because a whole bunch of you have asked for my input on that situation. In addition to that, a whole nother group of you have given me the indicator that I need to discuss this topic because you've been absolutely losing your crap over the last couple days. And if you're in that camp, look, I need you to sit down, take a breath, take a chill pill, and while you're down there, I need you to reach down onto the ground, pick up your cheese, and put it securely back on your cracker, because I'm going to explain to you why, essentially, the situation with Re Remington has resolved itself in the best case scenario possible. So to lay the groundwork for what it is that we're talking about today, in the United States, at the national level, arms suppliers and arms manufacturers are granted protections and legal commerce of arms. This is literally an act of Congress that has been law for a long period of time for the express purpose of protecting these vital businesses from frivolous lawsuits and persecution. And if you got a problem with that whole vital thing, well, then I need you to check yourself for a second because if you look at the status of arms manufacturers and arms suppliers in the United States for the last two years of this crisis that's been going on, they've been listed as essential businesses. Those protections are essential for a variety of reasons, but I think that if we were to pick one of those reasons that I think can transcend political barriers, I think it would be a discussion of national security. I think that most rational people have the ability to put together two synaptic firings that go in the same direction of, hey, yeah, our military needs guns. They don't do a very good job without weapons. There are two ways to ensure that misguided political activism doesn't interrupt the supply of American-made hardware to the American military. You either provide protections to everyone who's in the commerce of arms, or you do it for a select few of those manufacturers that are essential businesses to the general structure of how things operate. And so if you're one of those people that has a problem with protections in legal commerce of arms for everyone, and the shystiness of that whole situation. Boy, let me tell you what, you wanna talk about how fast you can get a plaintiff buried underneath of the concrete floor of a new facility that was built for the uh, military contractor that supplies the military because they're a business that's too big to fail. You, you think it's dark and cloak and dagger and all that stuff now, wait until you basically generate that. Right now, the United States military, the United States government has access to a lowest bidder situation. As in, if they don't like the price of what they're working with right now, they could just go to somebody else and get something else. Revoking those protections will drive companies towards integration with the military industrial complex that supplies the government to attain those protections in a backdoor sense. And if you want to write a recipe for corruption at its finest, let me write that down for you because I can't think of a better way to do it. But that's not what happened. They didn't go after Remington because they make guns. They went after Remington because they marketed guns to at-risk youths. And you might say, well, you know, that's really a stretch. Let's take a look at the ad in question. So if we look at this ad and I am intellectually honest, I can sort of see the angle at which the plaintiffs are attacking here. Because let's just be, let's call it what it is. This is so cringeworthy, it makes me want to puke. Okay, so real quick self plug here. If you are an arms manufacturer or arms supplier and you plan on putting out ads, I consult. I would love to work with you guys. I will check your ads before you put them out to make sure that you don't do crap like this because whoever is doing this is probably still working in the firearms industry and that is a crime in and of itself. And the good thing about that is I'm an independent contractor. You don't even have to put me on your payroll. Speaking of dollars and cents and cringeworthy ads, it's time to pay the bills. Elite U is an online service dedicated to information capture and transfer to the people. Their service provides detailed lessons on everything from protecting yourself without weapons, edged weapons, with a pistol, with a carbine, driving, which some of us need help with more than others, and clearing your house, all while instilling the mindset to prevail. They have built a team of elite instructors to cover all the bases and help you fill the gaps between your training sessions. So if you're intrigued and you want more information, then it's listed in the description box down below. And they also do all the social stuff. So if you want to see what they're talking about, then that isn't a resource that is also available. Um, the reason why I carry it like this is because in the moment, you don't have time to go, oh, hold on. 
let me put my suppressor on so I can shoot suppressed. Also carries subsonic ammo in here. Uh, when we were rolling overseas, we had 40 cal Glocks and uh, they were suppressed. And my snipers would always make their own little Kydex holsters that went in their cummerbund, like this one, to be able to have their suppressed pistol. So a lot of dogs in street lights got shot with those because you give kids toys that they want to play with them. Special thanks to Elite U for making today's video possible. So now that we set the groundwork for all the things involved here, the Supreme Court of Connecticut said that the lawsuit could proceed to court based on that whole thing with the state regulations on how the rifle was marketed. So for this to be applicable to any other situation inside the United States, you would have to have similar laws in the books of that prospective sp state where an incident occurred. And then on top of that, you probably also have to have the Supreme Court of those states say that it was okay to go forward as well. That's why that whole marketing thing was really important earlier. Call me. If I'm not mistaken, that happened in 2019. So this has been a foregone conclusion for some time and just nobody was talking about it. So everybody freaked out when they settled this, which, and I'm not so sure how much truth there is to this, but I think the insurance companies were the ones that actually settled. So to explain this, there's been this whole Remington estate auction that occurred. You guys saw the whole thing where they declare bankruptcy and this people got that and those people got this and that and the other. However, directly talking to the people who purchased those Remington brands, what they got was intellectual property. They didn't get any buildings. They didn't get any physical assets like the arms. They didn't get any equipment. They didn't get any personnel, none of it. So all of that stuff that was originally held by Remington was sold all for the purpose of building that $73 million settlement that they were going to offer them. So you kind of play it out in your mind and you say, Hey, look, here's the deal. We're going to, we have $73 million. We're going to offer you guys to, to settle this court case. And we suggest that you take it because we've sold everything. So what that means is that's the maximum number that we can give you. And we came to that number based on what we sold and then what we're paying our attorneys, etc. If you don't take that, then we're going to use all 73 million of it to fight you in court. And we're going to do our best to make it last probably five years. At which point, everybody will be tired of this. We'll be broke, so you never see any of the money. We suggest that you go ahead and take it. Oh my gosh, how could they possibly settle that easily? Because it was the best play. If Remington were to take this case to court and lose, then it would set a precedent that you can sue an arms manufacturer for their marketing and win. What this case demonstrated is that you can sue someone and if they're scared enough of losing to you, then they'll just pay you. Congratulations. What did you prove? So no precedent has been set whatsoever. There is no conclusion to this case other than it was settled. There was no opinion by any judge anywhere except for that the Supreme Court said, yeah, in this state, in this particular situation, you can go ahead and sue them and we'll see if you win. So what that means is that an insolvent company in Remington that was already on its last legs gave up an L for the benefit of everybody else. There are many documented instances throughout history where a provisional loss, as in uh, the seeding of a, of a small victory, maybe giving up some provisions or just a small little bit of territory, to avoid a decisive defeat has led to the overall winning of the war. And what I mean by that is not NRA mentality where we just kind of hang out and talk about stuff to raise money so that we can act like we're actually there doing stuff. And then when we're, our, our nuts are on the chopping block, we basically just kind of give up and, and go away to try to preserve our political clout and stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about losing until you win. And in this particular conflict that we're talking about, you have to have the advantage of opportunity to be able to do that. You have to have standing in court to be able to have those battles in the first place. In this instance, in my opinion, this was one of those that I thought, uh, eh, they're going to lose that probably. So instead of losing, they basically said, Hey, take this tribute and go away. And therefore 
they avoided the best opportunity in my mindset to attack the base of the Protection and Legal Commerce of Arms Act and erode the, the edges of it. And in doing so, they basically forfeited that opportunity. So my final thoughts on the topic. You need to be paying attention to what's going on in your state legislatures. If you see this sort of stuff moving through your legislature, then you need to be vocal and politically active. Because the people of Connecticut were asleep at the wheel on this one and gave us this whole mess. So it is no longer the job of the citizen to just simply vote for whoever is in their political column. You have to be paying attention and be communicative with your elective officials because they are all snakes and they will do whatever it is advances their personal agenda. It is up to you to keep your freedom. And if you aren't doing your job, then we end up with situations like this. So thank you to everybody who helped make this video possible, including Elite You and our Patreons on Patreon and Subscribe Star that you can see their names listed on screen right now.